Chapter Seven: The Stapletons of Merripit House. The fresh beauty of the following morning did something to efface from our minds the grim and grey impression which had been left upon both of us by our first experience of Baskerville Hall. As Sir Henry and I sat at breakfast, the sunlight flooded in through the high mullioned windows, throwing watery patches of colour from the coats of arms which covered them. The dark panelling glowed like bronze in the golden rays, and it was hard to realise that this was indeed the chamber which had struck such a gloom into our souls upon the evening before. "'I guess it is ourselves and not the house that we have to blame,' said the baronet. "'We were tired with our journey and chilled by our drive, so we took a grey view of the place. Now we are fresh and well, so it is all cheerful once more.' "'And yet it was not entirely a question of imagination,' I answered. "'Did you, for example, happen to hear someone—a woman, I think—sobbing in the night?' "'That is curious.' for i did when i was half asleep fancy that i heard something of the sort i waited quite a time but there was no more of it so i concluded that it was all a dream i heard it distinctly and i am sure that it was really the sob of a woman we must ask about it right away he rang the bell and asked barrymore whether he could account for our experience it seemed to me that the pallid features of the butler turned a shade paler still as he listened to his master's question there are only two women in the house sir henry he answered one is the scullery maid who sleeps in the other wing the other is my wife and i can answer for it that the sound could not have come from her and yet he lied as he said it for it chanced that after breakfast i met mrs barrymore in the long corridor with the sun full upon her face she was a large impassive heavy-featured woman with a stern set expression of mouth but her tell-tale eyes were red and glanced at me from between swollen lids it was she then who wept in the night and if she did so her husband must know it yet he had taken the obvious risk of discovery in declaring that it was not so why had he done this and why did she weep so bitterly already round this pale-faced handsome black-bearded man there was gathering an atmosphere of mystery and of gloom it was he who had been the first to discover the body of sir charles and we had only his word for all the circumstances which led up to the old man's death was it possible that it was barrymore after all whom we had seen in the cab in regent street the beard might well have been the same the cabman had described a somewhat shorter man but such an impression might easily have been erroneous how could i settle the point forever obviously the first thing to do was to see the grimpen postmaster and find whether the test telegram had really been placed in barrymore's own hands be the answer what it might i should at least have something to report to sherlock holmes sir henry had numerous papers to examine after breakfast so that the time was propitious for my excursion it was a pleasant walk of four miles along the edge of the moor leading me at last to a small grey hamlet in which two larger buildings which proved to be the inn and the house of dr mortimer stood high above the rest the postmaster who was also the village grocer had a clear recollection of the telegram certainly sir said he i had the telegram delivered to mr barrymore exactly as directed who delivered it my boy here james you delivered that telegram to mr barrymore at the hall last week did you not yes father i delivered it into his own hands i asked well he was up in the loft at the time so that he could not put into his own hands but i give it into mrs barrymore's hands and she promised to deliver it at once did you see mr barrymore no sir i tell you he was in the loft if you didn't see him how do you know he was in the loft well surely his own wife ought to know where he is said the postmaster testily didn't he get the telegram if there's any mistake it is for mr barrymore himself to complain it seemed hopeless to pursue the inquiry any farther but it was clear that in spite of holmes's ruse we had no proof that barrymore had not been in london all the time suppose that it were so suppose that the same man had been the last who had seen sir charles alive 
and the first to dog the new heir when he returned to england what then was he the agent of others or had he some sinister design of his own what interest could he have in persecuting the baskerville family i thought of the strange warning clipped out of the leading article of the times was that his work or was it possibly the doing of someone who was bent upon counteracting his schemes the only conceivable motive was that which had been suggested by sir henry that if the family could be scared away a comfortable and permanent home would be secured for the barrymores but surely such an explanation as that would be quite inadequate to account for the deep and subtle scheming which seemed to be weaving an invisible net round the young baronet Holmes himself had said that no more complex case had come to him in all the long series of his sensational investigations. I prayed as I walked back along the grey, lonely road that my friend might soon be freed from his preoccupations and able to come down to take his heavy burden of responsibility from my shoulders. Suddenly my thoughts were interrupted by the sound of running feet behind me and by a voice which called me by name. I turned expecting to see dr mortimer but to my surprise it was a stranger who was pursuing me he was a small slim clean-shaven prim-faced man flaxen-haired and lean-jawed between thirty and forty years of age dressed in a grey suit and wearing a straw hat a tin box for botanical specimens hung over his shoulder and he carried a green butterfly net in one of his hands you will i am sure excuse my presumption dr watson said he as he came panting up to where i stood here on the moor we are a homely folk and do not wait for formal introductions you may possibly have heard my name from our mutual friend mortimer i am stapleton of merripit house your net and box would have told me as much said i for i knew that mr stapleton was a naturalist but how did you know me i have been calling on mortimer and he pointed you out to me from the window of his surgery as you passed as our road lay the same way i thought that i could overtake you and introduce myself i trust that sir henry is none the worse for his journey he's very well thank you we were all rather afraid that after the sad death of sir charles the new baronet might refuse to live here it is asking much of a wealthy man to come down and bury himself in a place of this kind but i need not tell you that it means a very great deal to the countryside sir henry has i suppose no superstitious fears in the matter i do not think that it is likely of course you know the legend of the fiend dog which haunts the family i have heard of it it is extraordinary how credulous the pheasants are about here any number of them are ready to swear that they have seen such a creature upon the moor he spoke with a smile but i seemed to read in his eyes that he took the matter more seriously the story took a great hold upon the imagination of sir charles and i have no doubt that it led to his tragic end but how his nerves were so worked up that the appearance of any dog might have had a fatal effect upon his diseased heart i fancy that he really did see something of the kind upon that last night in the yew alley i feared that some disaster might occur for i was very fond of the old man and i knew that his heart was weak how did you know that my friend mortimer told me you think then that some dog pursued sir charles and that he died of fright in consequence have you any better explanation i have not come to any conclusion has mr sherlock holmes the words took away my breath for an instant but a glance at the placid face and steadfast eyes of my companion showed that no surprise was intended it is useless for us to pretend that we do not know you dr watson said he the records of your detective have reached us here and you could not celebrate him without being known yourself when mortimer told me your name he could not deny your identity if you are here then it follows that mr sherlock holmes is interesting himself in the matter and i am naturally curious to know what view he may take 
"'I am afraid that I cannot answer that question. "'May I ask him if he is going to honour us with a visit himself? "'He cannot leave town at present. "'He has other cases which engage his attention. "'What a pity! "'He might throw some light on that which is so dark to us. "'But as to your own researches, "'if there is any possible way in which I can be of service to you, "'I trust that you will command me.' if i had any indication of the nature of your suspicions or how you propose to investigate the case i might perhaps even now give you some aid or advice i assure you that i am simply here upon a visit to my friend sir henry and that i need no help of any kind excellent said stapleton you are perfectly right to be wary and discreet i am justly reproved for what i feel was an unjustifiable intrusion and i promise you that i will not mention the matter again we had come to a point where a narrow grassy path struck off from the road and wound away across the moor a steep boulder sprinkled hill lay upon the right which had in bygone days been cut into a granite quarry the face which was turned towards us formed a dark cliff with ferns and brambles growing in its niches from over a distant rise there floated a grey plume of smoke a moderate walk along this moor path brings us to merripit house said he perhaps you will spare an hour that i may have the pleasure of introducing you to my sister my first thought was that i should be by sir henry's side but then i remembered the pile of papers and bills with which his study table was littered it was certain that i could not help with those and holmes had expressly said that i should study the neighbours upon the moor i accepted stapleton's invitation and we turned together down the path it is a wonderful place the moor said he looking round over the undulating downs long green rollers with crests of jagged granite foaming up into fantastic surges you never tire of the moor you cannot think the wonderful secrets which it contains it is so vast and so barren and so mysterious you know it well then i have only been here two years the residents would call me a newcomer we came shortly after sir charles settled but my tastes led me to explore every part of the country round and i should think that there are few men who know it better than i do is it hard to know very hard you see for example this great plain to the north here with the queer hills breaking out of it do you observe anything remarkable about that it will be a rare place for a gallop you would naturally think so and the thought has cost several their lives before now you notice those bright green spots scattered thickly over it yes they seem more fertile than the rest stapleton laughed ah, that is the great grimpen mire said he a false step yonder means death to man or beast only yesterday i saw one of the moor ponies wander into it he never came out i saw his head for quite a long time craning out of the bog hole but it sucked him down at last even in dry seasons it is a danger to cross it but after these autumn rains it is an awful place and yet i can find my way to the very heart of it and return alive by george there's another of those miserable ponies something brown was rolling and tossing among the green sedges then a long agonized writhing neck shot upward and a dreadful cry echoed over the moor it turned me cold with horror but my companion's nerves seemed to be stronger than mine it's gone said he the mire has him two in two days and many more perhaps for they get in the way of going there in the dry weather and never know the difference until the mire has them in its clutches it's a bad place the great grimpen mire and you say you can penetrate it yes there are one or two paths which a very active man can take i have found them out but why should you wish to go into so horrible a place well you see the hills beyond 
they are really islands cut off on all sides by the impassable mire which has crawled round them in the course of years that is where the rare plants and the butterflies are if you have the wit to reach them i shall try my luck some day he looked at me with a surprised face for god's sake put such an idea out of your mind said he your blood would be upon my head i assure you that there would not be the least chance of your coming back alive it is only by remembering certain complex landmarks that i am able to do it hello i cried what is that a long low moan indescribably sad swept over the moor it filled the whole air and yet it was impossible to say whence it came from a dull murmur it swelled into a deep roar and then sank back into a melancholy throbbing murmur once again stapleton looked at me with a curious expression in his face queer place the moor said he but what is it the peasants say it is the hound of the baskervilles calling for its prey i've heard it once or twice before but never quite so loud i looked round with a chill of fear in my heart at the huge swelling plain mottled with the green patches of rushes nothing stirred over the vast expanse save a pair of ravens which croaked loudly from a tour behind us you are an educated man you don't believe such nonsense as that said i what do you think is the cause of so strange a sound bogs make queer noises sometimes it's the mud settling or the water rising or something no no that was a living voice well perhaps it was did you ever hear a bittern booming no i never did it is a very rare bird practically extinct in england now but all things are possible upon the moor yes i should not be surprised to learn that what we have heard is the cry of the last of the bitterns it's the weirdest strangest thing that ever i heard in my life yes it's rather an uncanny place altogether look at the hillside yonder what do you make of those the whole steep slope was covered with grey circular rings of stone a score of them at least what are they sheep pens no they are the homes of our worthy ancestors prehistoric man lived thickly on the moor and as no one in particular has lived there since we find all his little arrangements exactly as he left them these are his wigwams with the roofs off you can even see his hearth and his couch if you have the curiosity to go inside but it is quite a town when was it inhabited neolithic man no date what did he do he grazed his cattle on those slopes and he learned to dig for tin when the bronze sword began to supersede the stone axe look at the great trench in the opposite hill that is his mark yes you will find some very singular points about the moor dr watson oh excuse me an instant it is surely cyclopides a small fly or moth had fluttered across our path and in an instant stapleton was rushing with extraordinary energy and speed in pursuit of it to my dismay the creature flew straight for the great mire and my acquaintance never paused for an instant bounding from tuft to tuft behind it his green net waving in the air his grey clothes and jerky zigzag irregular progress made him not unlike some huge moth himself i was standing watching his pursuit with a mixture of admiration for his extraordinary activity and fear lest he should lose his footing in the treacherous mire when i heard the sound of steps and turning round found a woman near me upon the path she had come from the direction in which the plume of smoke indicated the position of merripit house but the dip of the moor had hid her until she was quite close i could not doubt that this was the miss stapleton of whom i had been told since ladies of any sort must be few upon the moor and i remembered that i had heard someone describe her as being a beauty the woman who approached me was certainly that and of a most uncommon type 
there could not have been a greater contrast between brother and sister for stapleton was neutral tinted with light hair and grey eyes while she was darker than any brunette whom i had seen in england slim elegant and tall she had a proud finely cut face so regular that it might have seemed impassive were it not for the sensitive mouth and the beautiful dark eager eyes with her perfect figure and elegant dress she was indeed a strange apparition upon a lonely moorland path her eyes were on her brother as i turned and then she quickened her pace towards me i had raised my hat and was about to make some explanatory remark when her own words turned all my thoughts into a new channel go back she said go straight back to london instantly i could only stare at her in stupid surprise her eyes blazed at me and she tapped the ground impatiently with her foot why should i go back i asked i cannot explain she spoke in a low eager voice with a curious lisp in her utterance but for god's sake do what i ask you go back and never set foot upon the moor again but i've only just come man man she cried can you not tell when a warning is for your own good go back to london start to-night get away from this place at all costs hush my brother's coming not a word of what i've said would you mind getting that orchid for me among the mare's tails yonder we're very rich in orchids on the moor though of course you are rather late to see the beauties of the place stapleton had abandoned the chase and come back to us breathing hard and flushed with his exertions hello beryl said he and it seemed to me that the tone of his greeting was not altogether a cordial one well jack you're very hot yes i was chasing a cyclopedes he is very rare and seldom found in the late autumn what a pity you that i should have missed him he spoke unconcernedly but his small light eyes glanced incessantly from the girl to me you have introduced yourselves i can see yes i was telling sir henry that it was rather late for him to see the true beauties of the moor why who do you think this is i imagine that it must be sir henry baskerville no no said i only a humble commoner but his friend my name is dr watson a flush of vexation passed over her expressive face we have been talking at cross purposes said she why you had not very much time for talk her brother remarked with the same questioning eyes i talked as if dr watson were a resident instead of being merely a visitor said she it cannot much matter to him whether it is early or late for the orchids but you will come on will you not and see merripit house a short walk brought us to it a bleak moorland house once the farm of some grazier in the old prosperous days but now put into repair and turned into a modern dwelling an orchard surrounded it but the trees as is usual upon the moor were stunted and nipped and the effect of the whole place was mean and melancholy we were admitted by a strange wizened rusty-coated old man-servant who seemed in keeping with the house inside however there were large rooms furnished with an elegance in which i seemed to recognize the taste of the lady as i looked from their windows at the interminable granite-flecked moor rolling unbroken to the farthest horizon i could not but marvel at what could have brought this highly educated man and this beautiful woman to live in such a place queer spot to choose is it not said he as if in answer to my thought and yet we manage to make ourselves fairly happy do we not beryl quite happy said she but there was no ring of conviction in her words i had a school said stapleton it was in the north country the work to a man of my temperament was mechanical and uninteresting but the privilege of living with youth of helping to mould those young minds and of impressing them with one's own character and ideals was very dear to me however the fates were against us a serious epidemic broke out in the school and three of the boys died it never recovered from the blow and much of my capital was irretrievably swallowed up and yet 
if it were not for the loss of the charming companionship of the boys i could rejoice over my own misfortune for with my strong taste for botany and zoology i find an unlimited field of work here and my sister is as devoted to nature as i am all this dr watson has been brought upon your head by your expression as you surveyed the moor out of our window it certainly did cross my mind that it might be a little dull less for you perhaps than for your sister no no i am never dull said she quickly we have books we have our studies and we have interesting neighbours dr mortimer is a most learned man in his own line poor sir charles was also an admirable companion we knew him well and miss him more than i can tell do you think that i should intrude if i were to call this afternoon and make the acquaintance of sir henry i am sure that he would be delighted then perhaps you would mention that i propose to do so we may in our humble way do something to make things more easy for him until he becomes accustomed to his new surroundings will you come upstairs dr watson and inspect my collection of lepidoptera i think it is the most complete one in the southwest of england by the time that you have looked through them lunch will be almost ready but i was eager to get back to my charge the melancholy of the moor the death of the unfortunate pony the weird sound which had been associated with the grim legend of the baskervilles all these things tinged my thoughts with sadness then on top of these more or less vague impressions there had come the definite and distinct warning of miss stapleton delivered with such intense earnestness that i could not doubt that some grave and deep reason lay behind it i resisted all pressure to stay for lunch and i set off at once upon my return journey taking the grass-grown path by which we had come it seems however that there must have been some short cut for those who knew it for before i had reached the road i was astounded to see miss stapleton sitting upon a rock by the side of the track her face was beautifully flushed with her exertions and she held her hand to her side i have run all the way in order to cut you off dr watson said she i had not even time to put on my hat i must not stop or my brother may miss me i wanted to say to you how sorry i am about the stupid mistake i made in thinking that you were sir henry please forget the words i said which have no application whatever to you but i can't forget them miss stapleton said i i am sir henry's friend and his welfare is a very close concern of mine tell me why it was that you were so eager that sir henry should return to london a woman's whim dr watson when you know me better you will understand that i cannot always give reasons for what i say or do no no i remember the thrill in your voice i remember the look in your eyes please please be frank with me miss stapleton for ever since i have been here i have been conscious of shadows all round me life has become like that great grimpen mire with little green patches everywhere into which one may sink and with no guide to point the track tell me then what it was that you meant and i will promise to convey your warning to sir henry an expression of irresolution passed for an instant over her face but her eyes had hardened again when she answered me you you make too much of it dr watson said she my brother and i were very much shocked by the death of sir charles we knew him very intimately for his favorite walk was over the moor to our house he was deeply impressed with the curse which hung over the family and when this tragedy came i naturally felt that there must be some grounds for the fears which he had expressed i was distressed therefore when another member of the family came down to live here and i felt that he should be warned of the danger which he will run that was all which i intended to convey but what is the danger you know the story of the hound i do not believe in such nonsense but i do if you have any influence with sir henry take him away from a place which has always been fatal to his family the world is wide why should he wish to live at the place of danger because it is the place of danger that is sir henry's nature i fear that unless you can give me some more definite information than this 
it would be impossible to get him to move i cannot say anything definite for i do not know anything definite i would ask you one more question miss stapleton if you meant no more than this when you first spoke to me why should you not wish your brother to overhear what you said there's nothing to which he or anyone else could object my brother is very anxious to have the hall inhabited for he thinks it is for the good of the poor folk upon the moor he will be very angry if he knew that i have said anything which might induce sir henry to go away but i have done my duty now and i will say no more i must go back or he will miss me and suspect that i have seen you good-bye she turned and had disappeared in a few minutes among the scattered boulders while i with my soul full of vague fears pursued my way to baskerville hall <laughs>